Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Barbara, for putting together this nice program and inviting me here. So yes, this will, these lectures will be on joint works with uh, several people uh, that you see on this uh, first slide. So two of them, uh, Manon Baudel and uh, Damien Landon are former PhD students, and then there are uh, four other <coughs> co-researchers I've been working with over the years. So let me start by explaining a little bit what is metastability. So I was going to share a few videos. So uh, yes, normally you should see <coughs> A video now so so that's an example of what is called uh, super cooled water so uh, you put water in a bottle uh, and you put it in the in the, your freezer and when you take it out actually the water is still liquid but when you pour it it turns into ice or some kind of slush so this is called super cooled water because before you pour it uh, even though it should be uh, in the ice state, it is not, and you need to add a little bit of energy to uh, transform it into uh, into ice. Uh, my colleague uh, Milton Chara said that uh, actually this uh, is very uh, popular in, in Brazil when it's hot. Uh, they do it with beer, so they actually mix uh, uh, beer or they put beer in the fridge, and then you get uh, something as a mixture of uh, liquid and frozen beer, which is apparently very pleasant to have when, uh, when it's hot out. So uh, let me show another couple of videos. So uh, the second one is now uh, one of the simplest uh, mathematical models where you can prove uh, things. So it's, it's the easing model. So let me just stop it for a second. So. Uh, so the easing model is a model for ferromagnetism where you have uh, plus or up and down spins. So here the yellow uh, squares are plus spins, the blue ones are down spins. And I've given the system, uh, I've put it in a negative magnetic field that is, uh, sorry, positive magnetic field favoring the plus spins. But uh, I started with all the spins down. So now I have a Glauber dynamics, meaning that I uh, randomly uh, select spins and try to turn them. And by doing that, you uh, you gain something because the spins want to be uh, yellow, but you also pay a price, which is related to the length of the of the interface between the yellow and blue. And for for that reason, uh, for quite a while, the system uh, produces little droplets, but they they go, they disappear until they reach a certain uh, size. And at this size, what happens is that actually you gain more by, uh, by the bulk term, by, by turning uh, the spin inside than you pay by the interface. And from that moment on, as you see here, the, uh, the droplets start growing uh, quite quickly and they will ultimately fill the, the whole domain. And this is for a very low temperature. That is why it takes a long time to, to make this transition. And uh, the last uh, video I want to show is for a slightly uh, more complicated system, which is uh, interacting particles. So these particles interact with a, uh, so let me put this in full resolution. So uh, the particles interact with the Leonard Jones potential, which is uh, strongly repulsive at short distances and mildly attractive at longer distances. And in this simulation, they are coupled to a thermostat, which is uh, one of several possible algorithms to uh, simulate the effect of temperature. And here what I've done is I've quite quickly cooled the system. And you see that it forms these uh, kind of droplets called grains, uh, where the uh, where the particles are arranged in a triangular lattice, 
but there were several defects. So right now uh, we are heating the system again. So the, the drops, the grains dissolve, so it becomes more liquid. And uh, now we are cooling the system again. And you will see uh, these, uh, these droplets, these grains uh, starting to appear again. So yeah, the color I should say depends on the number of neighbors. So the blue particles have six neighbors and uh, the green ones have five and, and so on. So, so you see after heating and cooling, we again have these grains, but they are a little bit bigger than before. And uh, what I'm doing here is a version of what's called simulated annealing. So again, now uh, we are heating the system, but a bit less uh, in the hope that it will, when we cool it again, achieve a state of lower energy. So the state with grains is a state with interfaces. The interface is coast energy. They don't correspond to the global minimum, which would be a very regular lattice but they are stuck in a local minimum. And by raising and lowering the temperature several times, you, uh, you get a more and more ordered uh, phase. So here you see we are again uh, lowering, lowering the temperature and now uh, the system has become more ordered. And if I just jump a bit ahead, uh, a bit later, you get something which is even more regular with uh, maybe four different uh, grains and the boundaries in between. All right, so uh, let me get back to the presentation. And uh, just uh, switch on my tablet. Okay, so. Uh, this is what I already showed you. And uh, here's what I, I want to talk about. So I, I want to talk about several mathematical models that allow to uh, describe quantitatively this meta stability. So the fact that this uh, certain uh, stochastic systems tends to spend long times in states which are not the, the real equilibrium state, not the lowest energy state. And today I'm uh, mainly going to talk about uh, Markov chains, which is the, the simplest uh, situation here. And, and the other lectures will be more about stochastic differential equations and maybe a little bit stochastic PDEs at the very end. Okay, and don't worry about the number of slides. These are the slides for all three lectures. So even though I'm maybe not as concise as, as Jean, uh, I think I'm, it's not, <clears throat> much more than, than that. So uh, let me start with a simple case of Markov chains on a finite set. So uh, let me look at this example. So here I have a very simple example of a Markov chain with uh, three states and uh, transition probabilities that depend on a small parameter epsilon. Uh, Okay, I guess, I guess most of you are familiar with Markov chains. If not, it's very simple. Uh, let's say you start in one state, like a state one here, and then with probability epsilon to the three, you jump to three, with probability epsilon to the four, you jump to two. In all other cases, you remain at one, and then uh, the next time you just repeat independently of what happened before. So uh, you can describe this chain by a graph or by a matrix. I use here the mathematician's convention that rows are the starting state and columns are the, uh, the final state. Uh, this has to be a stochastic matrix. So the entries have to be between zero and one. So epsilon has to be positive and uh, smaller than some maximal value that you can compute. And what you immediately realize is that there's a big difference between the case where epsilon is zero and where it's strictly positive. So when epsilon is zero, uh, the matrix, the identity matrix and just nothing happens, the system stays in uh, whichever state it started in. However, when epsilon is strictly positive, you have uh, a Markov chain with uh, nice properties. So in particular, it's irreducible, meaning you can go from any state to any other state with a strictly positive probability. 
And in, in such a case, uh, we know by the Perron-Frobenius theorem that uh, there will be a stationary probability distribution and it will be the solution of uh, just this eigenvalue problem. So one is an eigenvalue and the left eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue will be, uh, if it's correctly normalized, the probability distribution. And if you make the computation that, that's easy, to find a vector proportional to one, one plus epsilon, epsilon plus two epsilon squared. And there's a normalization, which is, uh, okay, just what you need to make the sum be equal to one. And this tells you that at equilibrium, the system will be in state one with a probability very close to one half if epsilon is small. Same for the state two and the probability to be in state three will be, close, will be of order epsilon. Now, uh, how uh, about convergence to pi naught? So this chain is also aperiodic, which means that you don't have this phenomenon where you can visit certain sites only at times which are not multiples of some integer larger than two. That doesn't happen here. So you know you will actually convert to uh, this uh, pi naught. And uh, the eigenvalues, so, so the speed of convergence can be characterized by the eigenvalues of the matrix P. And these are not so hard to compute. So we already know that one is an eigenvalue by Perron-Frobenius and the others, okay, a three by three matrix, we already knew, know one eigenvalue, it's not so hard to compute the other ones, uh, but it's not a very pleasant exercise either because uh, if you try, you, you have lots of epsilons everywhere, you get a not so nice formula. So what you do is that you tailor expand the result around epsilon equal uh, zero and then you get lambda one which has an expansion like this one minus two epsilon q plus a term of order epsilon five and lambda two which will be uh, one minus epsilon plus something of order epsilon square and now we we know that actually the speed of convergence will be given by this lambda one here so it will uh, be of the order of the inverse of one minus lambda one. So it will go like one over two epsilon three. And now uh, the question I'm asking here is, can, uh, can I get this, this three, this power three here without having to compute the eigenvalues by hand? Because of course I want to apply this to systems that have many more states, maybe dozens or hundreds of states. And then it's just not practical to compute every single eigenvalue. So, uh, so, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. And there are uh, uh, quite a few methods for doing this. So uh, if you look at the literature, there are a number of methods which are based on uh, linear algebra or analytic methods, which okay, are maybe more uh, close to computer science. So you can do things with graph theory by looking at the graph of this Markov chain. Uh, as we've seen in the example. Uh, there are also, I will be more inter interested in probabilistic methods. And there are quite a few people who have been work working on that. And uh, so one example is uh, so-called W graphs. So they were introduced by, by Alexander Wenzel in the early 70s and used a lot by Freilin and Wenzel in their work on the uh, large deviations for, for SDEs. Uh, these are actually not so easy to use, I found, because, uh, okay, you work with a lot of subgraphs of, of the graphs of, of your system, and uh, I found it kind of tricky to use, though I have to say that, that Masha Cameron has done some really nice work uh, recently on, on this kind of things. Another thing you may want to do is uh, lumping of states. So uh, what I mean by this is if I look at the system here, I, I see that actually the states two and three uh, seem to communicate much more. So I, I will make many jumps between two and three before I have a chance of seeing a jump between one and two or three. 
because just of the powers of epsilon. Yeah. So somehow uh, what one would like to do is to form a big, a bigger state, two and three put lumped together. Uh, but the problem with that is that then you use the Markov property. So what you will have in effect is a hidden Markov chain. So uh, you have to be a bit careful with that. Another thing uh, people have done is speeding up time. So uh, what this means is in, in this particular case, you see that you expect to wait a time of order one over epsilon to jump from three to two. But uh, if you know speed up time by a factor one over epsilon, jumps between three and two will become more frequent, but they will still be where between one and the other states. So uh, that is an interesting approach, but it's not so easy to use because computing powers and large powers of my matrix P is not easier than determining its eigenvalues. And there's a third approach which uses actually ideas from, from the previous two, but in a more efficient way, which is called the trace process. And that's uh, what I want to talk about today. So, um, so let me consider the following settings. So for now, I have a finite set. I have an irreducible aperiodic Markov chain with a certain transition matrix. And I'm going to look at uh, two different processes. So the first one, uh, given a subset A of, of my uh, state space, I'm going to look at the process killed upon leaving the set A. So uh, this process, uh, you can look at it just by saying that you uh, put all coefficients in the matrix equal to zero outside A, uh, which is the same as actually looking just at this matrix here, PA. Uh, now, if you do that, uh, it's not a Markov chain anymore because the row sums are not one. So what you can always do is, uh, is just add a, a cemetery state. So what this uh, amounts to is to say that you will uh, will actually, so you kill this and, and uh, oh, sorry, but, um, you kill just this probability here. So here, here you will put one. And uh, now three has, uh, has become an absorbing state. But anyway, the dynamics in the set A uh, composed of one and two is just given by a, a two by two matrix uh, with some loss of mass. So you can look at the, uh, at the eigenvalues of, of the matrix PA, you can compute them. And what you find is that uh, what's called the principal eigenvalue, which is the largest eigenvalue in the model, modulus of PA, which is still real actually, uh, thanks to Pepper Frobenius, it behaves like, let me call it lambda not A, it behaves like one minus epsilon cube plus uh, some higher order terms. And uh, so, so this gives me uh, actually uh, control of how uh, fast I will leave the set A. So I, I will still have to wait a time of order one over epsilon three to have uh, an appreciable probability of leaving the set A. And you can uh, also look at what is called the QSD, which is the quasi-stationary distribution. And uh, so that would be uh, the left eigenvector. Uh, okay, let me put the A here, so, so, so the left eigenvector for this eigenvalue, which is not one because I'm, I'm losing mass, but then you find that this uh, pi not A behaves approximately like one uh, epsilon square. So what does this uh, describe? Well, uh, one thing is that pi not a times the a to the n will be given by lambda not a to the n pi not a, which says, uh, so, so that, gives me the evolution of the probability distribution in the set A as time goes on. And it tells me that 
if I, st uh, I start in this QSD, I, uh, I will still, I will lose mass, but I will remain, if I condition on uh, being still in, in the set A, I, I will uh, remain actually in this distribution. So, so that's going to be an important object in the following. Now, but the, the really important object is uh, the trace process, and this, to my knowledge, was introduced by Landim and, and Beltrano some years ago. And uh, so I'm in the same setting as before, and now I want to look at the process uh, which is monitored only when it stays in the set A. So what I mean by that is that I, I start somewhere in, in X, which is an A. I look at the first return time to the set A. So the first time starting in one at which I am back in, the, in my set A. And uh, I look what is the probability of returning at a particular point Y. So it's actually not hard to find uh, an explicit expression for, for this here. So uh, let me first, so let me do a little computation here. So I will first uh, distinguish two cases. So for either my return time is one, and then I want to be in my point Y, or uh, the return time is strictly larger than two. And then again, I want to return uh, at point Y. Now uh, the first, the first term here, this one, is nothing but p of x y, because well, if tor plus a is one, it just means that at time one I'm at a, uh, I'm in a and at point y, and uh, okay, that's actually the same as p a of x y, just uh, another notation. And for the second term. So this one here, uh, let me decompose over all. Uh, so if tau A is uh, at least two, it means that I visit at least once uh, the complement of A. So let me sum over all points in the complement of A. So first I have to go to this, uh, to a point Z in the A complement. And then I can do, I can return immediately, or I can do a certain number of, uh, of iterations in A complement. So let me decompose over this number of iterations. So I can write this as this. So, uh, so that would be uh, the, so I, I now, so N will be the, the number of, uh, it will be the value of the return time. And so I can do a certain number of iterations in uh, a complement. So let me also sum over Z prime. And uh, I end up in a certain uh, point Z prime, and then I have to go back. Okay, P A C is just my uh, matrix P restricted to A complement. Now here I recognize uh, a geometric series. So that's nothing that then one minus PAC, uh, PAC inverse element Z, Z prime. So you see, I have a, a nice uh, formula for my transition probability of my uh, trace process and I can rewrite this in more condensed form uh, in a matrix form in the following way. So, uh, so the transition matrix of my trace process has uh, two terms. So that was the first term, which was just uh, P restricted to A. And the second term contains a transition to A complement a certain number of iterations and uh, the fact that I go back. So this is actually related to something known in uh, uh, the theory of uh, matrices, linear algebra, it's a sure complement. So I mean, this uh, 
this matrix uh, this, uh, subscript AP is, uh, is, is related to the sure complement of, uh, of PA inside the matrix P. So uh, let us just see how this works on our example. So I'm back with uh, an example I started with. So let me take one, two for my set A. And let me just make a little computation. So I want to compute this matrix here. So uh, what I said is that first I have to take my uh, matrix PA, which is this block here. So let me just copy this one minus epsilon cube minus epsilon four, epsilon cube, epsilon four, and one minus epsilon squared minus epsilon cube. Okay, and then I have this term, uh, so I have to multiply three matrices. So the first one is, uh, is the column uh, matrix I have here. Okay, so, so then I have epsilon cube, epsilon squared. Okay, then, then I put uh, the inverse of uh, one minus this one, which is nothing than one over epsilon. And finally, I multiply by this matrix here. And that gives me uh, so zero epsilon. Now this product here, that is in fact matrix, first column is zero, and then I have epsilon cube, epsilon squared. And uh, so what I get in the end is matrix, okay, I don't change the first column. And the second column is now uh, given by epsilon cube plus epsilon four and one minus epsilon cube. So one thing you immediately see is that the row sums are now one. So it's again a stochastic matrix. Well, it, it has to be by construction. So uh, the, the process it describes is now a, a two-state Markov chain with uh, transition probabilities, which are uh, so epsilon cube plus epsilon four and uh, uh, epsilon cube, and based on probabilities to remain in the states so one and two. Uh, and you can actually easily uh, compute the eigenvalues because uh, so one eigenvalue by pair of Frobenius is one, and the other one you can easily see uh, by uh, observing that the trace of the matrix is two uh, minus two of epsilon cube minus epsilon four. So the second one is uh, one minus two epsilon cube, uh, epsilon cube minus epsilon four. And let me just recall uh, the, eigenvalues of P we have found before. So we had one, of course. The second eigenvalue was one minus two epsilon cube plus a remainder of higher order. And, and okay, there was a, a third eigenvalue, which doesn't matter so much here. And uh, let me observe that these two start in the same way. The higher order term is different, but the leading terms are the same. So what this tells me is that apparently, at least on this example, the trace process on the set A has eigenvalues which are close to the eigenvalues of the original matrix, and it is somehow easier to compute. All right, so um, let me just, before I go on, uh, give you another application of the trace process that I like very much. So I didn't uh, say it at the beginning, but here in this talk, I'm not going to assume that my Markov chain is reversible. So uh, in general, uh, pi naught of x, p of x, y is different from the reversed quantity. If uh, these quantities were equal, uh, things are much easier, and there are really much more powerful techniques, and I will come back to these uh, on, on Wednesday, but here I'm not assuming uh, something like this. Nevertheless, you can show that you have a kind of reversibility on the level of return time. So P 
peanut of x times uh, the probability starting in x to hit y before returning to x is equal to the symmetric quantity uh, for any point x and y in a. And this result uh, is very easy to prove in the reversible case. And uh, I've seen a, a first proof of this case in a paper by Volker Bates and, and Stefan Leroux, uh, where they the proof is uh, using the fact that the probability, the invariant probability measure is related. It's actually the inverse of the mean return time. But let me give you a, a different proof, which is much shorter, I, I think, because I can do it in two lines. So you just have to observe that if you restrict the invariant probability to the set A, it has to be invariant by the trace process. I think it's quite uh, intuitive that this is the case, uh, but you can easily check it by writing out the matrices. But let me now take as A the set XY and let me uh, write what this means in the variance. So pi naught of X should be equal to pi naught AP of X. With, when I write the definition of the trace process, that's nothing but the probability starting in pi naught that x at time at the return time to a is equal to lowercase x. And, and this is a sum of two terms, right? So that's p naught of x times probability starting at x that I return to a at point x plus another term where I start at y and the same I want to return <coughs> to a at point x. Now uh, this second probability here is actually exactly the same as the probability starting at y that you hit x so we return to x before hitting y. And the first uh, here, I, I go to the complement, I write it as one minus probability starting at x that I hit y before returning to x. And now we are done because you see, I can simplify my, my equality here by this term, move uh, one part to the left side and I have exactly uh, my proposition. So it's a two-line proof of, of this nice property. All right, so now I want to, uh, to return to this uh, observation that at least in some cases, the trace process gives me uh, information on the eigenvalues of the process I started with. And uh, it, it will not always be true. So let me give you uh, a, def uh, a definition of a property which will ensure something like that. So given a, a subset A of my state space, I'm going to look at two probabilities, so uh, or two uh, quantities which are related by probabilities. The first one, P in of A, that will be the smallest probability if I start outside A, that after one iteration I land in A. P out of A will be the largest probability starting in A to go uh, outside A in one step. And I will say that A is a good domain if the ratio of these two probabilities goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So let's see how this works in an example. So again, it's always the same example. So what is P in of A? Well, I, A complement contains only one point, which is three. And uh, from three, I go to one or two with probability epsilon. Now, what is P out of A? Well, if I'm at one, I, the probability to leave A is epsilon to the three. If I'm at two, it's epsilon to the two. Uh, so I take this one. And you see that the ratio of P out and P in here is uh, equal to epsilon, so it goes to zero. So A, so uh, yeah, A, I forgot to recall, is the set one, two. So one, two is a good set. 
Now, uh, here is the, the main idea of why uh, the observation I made before works in this case. Uh, it's the following one. So let me write again P uh, in block form. So with four blocks uh, related to A and A complement. Uh, the main idea is that for good domains, this matrix P is well approximated by a matrix P hat. Uh, in which I don't change anything uh, in the lower rows, but the upper row I replace actually by my trace process. So if you wish, it's a process where if I start outside of A, I don't change anything. But if I stay stayed in A, I just forget anything that happens outside of A. I just look at the probabilities to uh, return to A uh, where, where this return occurs. So now what do I mean by well approximated? Well, there's several ways of, of doing this. And the first thing you can do is say that the two matrices P and P hat are close in some norm. So here it turns out that, that one norm which uh, is useful here is given by, by this uh, thing here. So I take this uh, soup, actually the max here over all uh, rows of the sum over all columns of the absolute value of the, the difference of matrix elements, which you can easily check. Uh, it's actually the operator soup norm of the matrix Q as uh, the uh, uh, so as acting on vectors on the right, or it's also the operator L1 norm with Q acts on the left. And there's a simple lemma which tells uh, me that the difference of uh, the norm of, uh, of the difference of P and P hat is exactly twice P out of A. So let me just show uh, why this is true. So let me uh, compute P hat minus P norm. So the first thing you observe is uh, that it's sufficient to take the soup over all rows which correspond to A because you would have zero otherwise. And uh, now you will also, you can restrict or, uh, or whether I will make a difference between Y in A and in A complement. Now, uh, there's one uh, thing we've, uh, we've seen before, which is that the matrix of the trace uh, process is, uh, is larger equal than, uh, than the matrix of the kilt process. So point-wise, element-wise. So that, that was just because AP is PA plus something uh, non-negative. So uh, this means that in the first uh, sum y over a, I can just remove absolute values. So here I can write a p of x y and minus sum over y, and here I have p a of x y, and uh, and then uh, I have the remaining terms, and the remaining terms are, are positive. So I just have the sum y in a complement of p x of x uh, p of x. Okay. Uh, now the observation is that uh, this this thing here is just one, right? Because my trace process is a Markov chain, so that's just the probability that I return to a, which is one. And uh, and this uh, this thing here, uh, well, that is uh, that is just uh, I mean, that is related to p out of a, and the supremum uh, over x will just give me p out of a. Okay, but for for the last term, I have just one minus something, which is exactly the same the same term. So. I really get exactly twice the p out of it. So uh, maybe I can make it a bit clearer. Uh, that is actually the soup x and a two probability from one from 
um, x to a complement, and, and that is uh, exactly twice p alpha. All right, so uh, what do I do with this information? So there's a first thing I can do, and that is related to uh, effect and, and spectral theory, which I'm not going to explain in detail, but it tells you something about eigenvalues of matrices which, uh, which are close by in some norm. So uh, what it tells you is that if, let me call lambda hat the simple eigenvalue of p hat. And let me assume that it is at, at a distance which is larger than, than this norm of the difference from the remaining eigenvalues of p hat. Then I can show that uh, p has also a unique eigenvalue uh, at a distance of this order. And, and this you can do using a little bit of complex analysis. So you can use what's called a, a Ries projector, which uses the, uh, the resolvent of the matrix. So uh, to, to see how this helps, so, so let me recall here. So I have my matrix P hat, which is given by AP. And uh, now let me assume that A complement is just one point. So here I will have something like PXA. Uh, so yeah, that's PXA. Here I have zero. And the last element, uh, well, that, that will be, of course, because I have a block diagonal form, that will be an eigenvalue of P hat. And, and this eigenvalue is, uh, is exactly, uh, so uh, it, it is related to, the, uh, to this P in of A, as we've seen in the example, right? So one minus lambda hat, that's one minus the probability starting in X to go back to X. And that's exactly my P in of A. And so what this tells me is that uh, you see uh, by this uh, uh, spectral theory result, I can tell you that I will have an eigenvalue lambda for the matrix P, which is uh, actually close to uh, one minus lambda hat with an error of order P out by my previous lemma. And so the, I can factor out one minus lambda hat because that is P in. And so what I get is one minus lambda hat times one plus something small. So uh, this uh, is helpful uh, for part of my problem. So if, if I go back to my uh, example, P hat has the following form. So I have this, uh, this block form here. So I have the, the trace matrix uh, at the top left. And this matrix has eigenvalues. We've seen them before. So, uh, okay, there's one minus epsilon, which is this one, and, and the two others we have computed before. So there was one and there was one minus two epsilon, two minus epsilon. Four. Now, how do they perturb? So what, the result here tells me is that for my matrix P, this one will perturb to something where I add a small uh, correction. So, so that is good. But here you see that if I perturb, I can only say that I have an error of order epsilon squared, which is larger than the uh, minus two epsilon cube. So, so my result is useful for one of the eigenvalues, but not for the other ones. That's completely useless. However, fortunately you can improve. Uh, so we have to do something to improve uh, the comparison for the eigenvalues corresponding to the set A. And that you can do using Laplace transforms. So uh, if U is a complex number, uh, I define the Laplace transform uh, of the first hitting time of A uh, in the following way. So it's the expectation of the exponential U times this time. Uh, 
it is uh, quite easy to see that it exists. It, it will not in general exist for any complex number, but it will exist if uh, the exponential of minus u satisfies uh, the condition you see here. And that is just related to the fact that uh, you can bound above the probability of uh, not returning to A after n steps by something like one minus P into the N. And then you have just a geometric series for some. Now, the, the really nice result uh, we are going to use, use here is a kind of feynman katz relation. There are many uh, results uh, of the same flavor in stochastic processes. So this is one of them. Uh, so it establishes a link between a certain boundary value problem and uh, a certain uh, probabilistic object. So uh, what it tells here is that I have a boundary value problem, which looks like my eigenvalue problem, so which is this here, except that I, so phi looks like an eigenfunction, but I assume I know its value on A. And what the, the proposition tells me is that if the Laplace transform exists, then uh, knowing the eigenfunction in A, I can actually compute the eigenfunction in the complement of A by uh, using something which is related to this Laplace transform. So maybe I can give an idea of how that works. So uh, there are two cases to consider. So first, if X is an A, so I'm just gonna check that this expectation is, uh, is really a solution. So uh, tau A, uh, yeah, just be careful. Tau A is now the, not the first return time, but the first hitting time. So there's a small difference. Uh, N can be zero before it had to be at least one. So uh, if I start in A, so A uh, will be zero, and then phi of X will be just, uh, well, the expectation of one times uh, phi bar of X at time zero. So uh, that will just be uh, phi bar of X. So the boundary condition is satisfied. So that's okay. And now if X is not an A, uh, what I do is, it's a bit similar to what I did before. So, okay, let me just write out what P phi of X is. So that's the sum of the Y, P of X, Y, uh, phi of Y. But in probabilistic terms, that is nothing else than the expectation starting at X of my function phi at time x1. And now uh, I'm going to uh, again split this in two terms. So uh, the first term, uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, put here the indicator function that x1 is an A. Okay, and I replace phi by the expression I have up there. So it's given by the expectation starting in x1 of exponential u tau a phi bar of x tau a. And then I have a similar term, uh, expectation starting at x of ex1, the same thing. And now I put an indicator x1 as an uncontinued. So uh, now what do I observe here? So uh, if x1 is uh, in A, then uh, tau A is one. Uh, so this term I, I can rewrite. So first I, I can uh, extract uh, phi bar of x1. And what remains is uh, exponential of u. Uh, so, and this I can actually, I can rewrite as, as this. Uh, yeah, I actually, 
the exponential is zero, but I can rewrite it like this on that side. And the other one here, uh, that is nothing but I'll do a similar trick. So just by shifting my time, so it's exponential u to a minus one. And then I have pi bar of x to a. So basically I, I use the stacking property of conditional expectation and I have my indicator function x1 in a complement. And if I put these two things together, I get an exponential minus u. I can put again together the two indicator functions and I get e to the u to a pi bar of x to a, which is exactly uh, what I wanted because that is e to the minus u phi of x. All right, so that uh, that shows that uh, this phi is a is a solution, and the uh, uniqueness part you can do in a standard way by taking the difference of two uh, solutions and, for instance, using the Feldholm alternative you can prove uniqueness. Okay, so uh, what does this tell me now? So it tells me that if I know my eigenfunction in my set A, I know it everywhere but I still have to find it inside A. But you see what I can do now is say, okay, I, I need to know this fiber of X, the value of phi in A, but this also satisfies a certain, uh, a certain equation. And uh, what you can prove by a very similar expression is the following thing. So again, under this existence uh, condition of the Laplace transform, being a solution of the eigenvalue uh, equation in x by using uh, the previous result is actually equivalent to being a solution of an eigenvalue equation which is restricted to a and with a matrix which has uh, the following form which is again a kind of a laplace transform now the important thing to observe is that if my parameter u is equal to zero, then act actually uh, this exponential disappears and I get the probability starting in x that I return to a at y and that is exactly my trace process. So if a if u equals zero, my matrix here is, uh, is my trace point, the matrix of the trace process. Okay, so I, I'm not going to, to give you the proof here. Uh, it is very similar to what we've seen before. Uh, now you may just be puzzled about the fact that I'm trying to solve uh, an eigenvalue problem, but now my matrix also depends on the eigenvalue. Well, that's actually, uh, you just have to uh, view this as a system. So I have, I want to solve that's my eigenvalue equation, but I, I have this condition that exponential minus u should be equal to lambda. So it's like two equations with two elements. Now, there, there's a last part uh, to be able to make our argument work, uh, which is the following bound on the difference of the norms of this new uh, matrix APU and the matrix of the trace process. And that was actually one of the important achievements of, of Manon Boudet's thesis, uh, which gives you a bound uh, on this norm in terms of these quantities P in and P out I've introduced before. So the proof of that one is a little bit more difficult, but uh, not so hard. It's mainly you, okay, you have to understand that this is what you want to prove. So it uses again boundary value problems. So let me just uh, explain you why this is useful. Uh, I can rewrite this uh, bound in the following way. So if I divide by one minus e to the minus u on both sides, so that will be smaller than something like that I can write as p out over p in. 
divided by one minus one minus this exponential over P. And we have already assumed that the numerator here is small compared to one, epsilon is small. So what this tells me is that if A is good and uh, one minus E to the minus U is small compared to P in, which was one minus lambda hat in my example, then uh, these, these two uh, matrices are actually close by and I can use again a similar argument on stability of eigenvalues. So uh, in my example, what I had was that AP had eigenvalues which were one and one minus two epsilon cubed minus epsilon four. And if I take uh, this thing here, so this uh, thing here will be uh, actually indeed of order epsilon. And, uh, and so it, it gives me a, a relative bound. So it tells me that if one minus e to the minus u is small compared to epsilon, then, uh, well, indeed, I, I, you see, I have a bound on the eigenvalues, which is uh, multiplicative. So, so then I, I really have uh, that one minus two epsilon cube minus epsilon four perturbs to one minus two epsilon cube times one plus order of epsilon. So, so now I, I, I have a method that works to, so let me just uh, recap the method. So assume I, I have uh, one state in my state space from which it is easier to escape than from all other states. So that is the condition here. So that's the probability of leaving X, which is large compared to the probability of leaving any other state. Then I take uh, as A uh, the state space minus this uh, state there. I know it's a good set. Then, uh, okay, I, I know already uh, that the eigenvalues uh, I'm looking for are close to, to this P, uh, one minus P of XX with an error that I control. Then I compute the trace matrix and then I just iterate the procedure. And by doing that, the kind of result you get is, is the following. So you get the sequence of nested subsets each time you remove one state. And uh, each state, each uh, subset is a good set for the previous one. And then you get some uh, expressions for the eigenvalues. So you always have the eigenvalue one. And then the next eigenvalues are actually close to uh, something which is related uh, to this probability of uh, you know, hitting the, the next root set uh, before returning to the state you, you came from. So that's something which is actually uh, rather computable. And then you also have eigen, uh, information on the eigenfunctions or eigenvectors. So you can show that actually the right eigenvectors are close to these, uh, uh, which are called committer probabilities. And uh, you can also show that the left eigenvectors are close to these quasi-stationary distributions I, I mentioned before. Okay, so that's the main result for today. Uh, let me just finish with one uh, slide showing that we also thought about what happens in the degenerate cases. So here's an example where actually all sides three, four, and five have the same probability of uh, that you leave these sides. So it's always epsilon. Uh, so you can't apply this algorithm, but there's still a, a way of uh, generalizing the algorithm I just showed you. Uh, somehow you first have to deal with these three uh, comparable states, three, four, five, and, uh, 
and then you can reduce things and reduce things to uh, to a system which will no longer be degenerate, and uh, and you get these uh, these eigenvalues. So uh, that was was it for today. So next time tomorrow I will show you that similar ideas work for uh, continuous space Markov chains and uh, how to apply this to stochastic differential equations. And I think it's time to stop. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your nice talk.